Hello everyone, my name is Jordana Caputo. I am the CEO of the Community Media Training Organization and I'm very pleased to welcome you this evening to our last Technorama Tuesday for the year. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I'm broadcasting to you from, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, we acknowledge their um, elders past, present and emergence emerging and um, recognize that sovereignty was never ceded. Please let us know what um, lands you are coming from in the chat and um, throughout the session this evening if you have a question you can put it in the Q&A or you can put it in the chat. I'll be keeping an eye on it throughout the um, evening as we progress. Tonight is a very free form, very informal, very everyone gets to turn their mic on at some point session. So um, we are going to be handing over to John Mazels from Technorama in just a moment, along with his amazing panel. Um, so have your questions ready. We did get a few via email um, and uh, we'll do our best to answer them. Um, so introducing da -da -da -da, the panel, <laughs> Stump the Chumps, John Mazels and Alistair and Stephen and Evan Wyatt, our very special guests. <laughs> Thank you very much, Geordie. What a wonderful introduction. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm coming to you tonight from Camaraygal country. Um, our panel is ready to ask your question. So it's the usual format. We have no idea what you want to talk about other than the people who've already sent questions. We have no idea what we're going to talk about. We all had a bit of a chat before uh, just to get a bit of warmed up. So now you could assume that we're completely brain dead. Um, we want to go and have dinner the same way that you do. So this could all be over in three seconds or it could be a really great night. Uh, so if you want to ask a question, drop it into the chat or drop it into the question bank. Jordi, which, which would you prefer? You want to drop it in the question bank? No, you got muted. Q&A is good because then you can upvote them, um, the questions, ah. and also everyone can see the answer um, uh, if we type answers in there we, as well. If we put answers in there. Okay, do, do that. Um, now, so the format tonight is that we will keep going until one of two things happen. We get bored, nothing is happening, everybody has gone, or maybe uh, so about eight o'clock. So sometime between 7.30 and, and 8, we're going to, going to pull the pin so we can all go and um, uh, watch television or whatever else is on tonight on a Tuesday. Uh, Geordie, do you have any announcements from CMTO? Anything that we want to tell everybody while nobody's here? Well, um, I thought that we could let people know that uh, Summer of Online Learning is coming up. So there's a bunch of self-paced courses that you can do to keep your head in the game throughout the summer period on the CMTO website. So if you just head to cmto.org.au and go to online learning, you'll be able to view every single Technorama Tuesday webinar, because of course you want to go back and look at those. And you'll also be able to look at all of the CBAA webinars that we've done over the last year. And you can also sign yourself up to do our online courses. We've got one introduction to media law for community broadcasters introduction to workplace health and safety in the studio and then our very popular one which is introduction to creating content remotely so mm. um, jump online have a look at those spend your summer um, brushing up on some of your skills and um, just to let you know John we've got 16 people in the room oh be still my beating heart uh, Geordie um, uh, charges for those courses so it is $11 to do um, those self-paced courses, each one, that includes the GST. But if you've got a group of you at the station that want to do it, send me an email, um, jordana at cmto.org.au or info at cmto.org.au and we will happily give you a free code for those. Ooh. So I'll pop my email into the chat. So um, if you want to get a free code, you can um, email me and let me know that you're at the Technorama Tuesday session and um, I'll happily give you one. What a, what a great deal. So you attend, we, we didn't even tell people that was going to happen. Free stuff because you were here on Technorama Tuesday. So uh, let me just cover up a couple of things that are happening with Technorama. Uh, one, the annual general meeting will be uh, two weeks today. So the announcement will go out uh, a little bit later this evening um, after we've all cleared down from here <laughs> and we and we breathe. Uh, so that will go out. So hold uh, seven o'clock on Tuesday, the 21st of December for the 
absolutely scintillating Technorama annual general meeting. But there are um, there are five positions up for nomination for this year. Elections important. If you would like to get involved with an organisation in the sector that is doing great stuff for techos, um, have a chat. G give me a call if you'd like to know what's involved. Um, it's um, joining an organisation and, and getting on the committee is really a great way to, to work out what's going on and to get involved, capital I, capital I involved. Do it, trust me, it will change your life when you get involved. Uh, people have been asking about Technorama. Well, of course, there isn't gonna be a Technorama 21. Um, COVID really saw the end of that. We're looking at our options for next year. So probably around about mid-year again, and we're tossing up at the moment whether we can run in a regional location. We have one in mind, or we do it in Sydney because it's nice and safe and everybody can get here and the borders aren't likely to close. Boo, who knew? So uh, keep your eye on that. We'll, we'll sort of tell you what's going on. And uh, apart from that, I think it is time to introduce the uh, the, the chumps on the panel. Um, so joining me is Stephen Wilkinson. Good evening, Stephen. Good evening. Nice to be here. Coming from? I'm coming from the Durug people's land in uh, the Blacktown area. Excellent. Evan Wyatt just stepped off a plane from Groot Island or Groot -d 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 Island or, or somewhere and muted. And muted. Um, I'm, I'm only a tech, sorry. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, and no, I was great. Just put the bags down, turn the computer on, and here I am on a panel. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> As um, it happens. Yeah. Home is cans. <laughs> Beautiful cans, yes. Beautiful cans, where there will, of course, be a CBAA conference yep. coming up next year. Yep. I'll be looking forward to that. Yep. Um, Evan, I'm reserving the spot on your floor. Ooh. <laughs> I've already got didn't enough about that, did you? <laughs> okay. I will find a spot. We'll find a spot. Later. Yes. Okay. This um, is coming from the ocean. And land that you come from is? Yes. Put me on the spot there, haven't you? I did. Okay, we'll come back to that. Yeah. Let, let me, <laughs> You're going to look that up. Yeah. And um, Alistair Reynolds, uh, Owl, formerly yeah. of 2UE and well known community radio assist person, teacher and purveyor of amplitude modulation equipment. Uh, yes, and FM equipment as well, but uh, yes. I'm and DAB to... equipment also. DAB, we love Factum. Uh, no, I'm coming <laughs> to you from uh, Guringai country. Excellent. So here's our panel of chumps for this evening, uh, a wealth of expertise, except for me. And our first question actually comes from somebody who's on the screen. Uh, Jordi Caputo said earlier, hmm, I'm putting together a home studio. What should I be putting in there? Well, um, a, a table and a chair. <laughs> but I that's not much of what I've got so far. So, so look, tell us what sort of studio you want to create, and let's let's throw this out to the uh, to the panel. All right. So, um, as you know, we've been doing a lot of content. Um, production remotely this last two years, right? Because we haven't been able to get to studios. So we've been teaching people how to do it. And, um, you know, my preference is obviously to do the drop of my audio into an Audacity kind of session or a Hindenburg session. I'll just record my audio in the studio mm. over at the CRN and drag and drop. But then I thought, I've got a turntable at home. I've got my computer. Um, I got a three channel mixer, a little three channel Newmark mixer. And I thought, why not mix a live show from my mm. home? What else do I need? Possibly another turntable and another um, channel on the mixer and a few other things. But okay, what, what's the program that enough, you want to surely. create? Well, you know, you can you can stop. So let's stuff. just what? say it's just a straight music music program. I want to play a couple of tracks and I want to I want to talk. Okay, so this is a question that comes up a bit. Uh, Stephen, what would you put in a studio uh, for a home studio? Um, you've got to start with a bar fridge. I think that's the most important thing. Mm. Uh, you know, keep your Coke cool. Um, no, acoustically, yeah. acoustically lined bar fridge, of course. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. with no engine um, motor noise. Right. Um, you, uh, yeah. So, are you wanting to go live? Is that was that what one of the? I kind of want to. I kind of want to give the live experience. I listened to a lot of Two SCR during lockdown, right? And there were some amazing DJs. You know, Two SCR does incredible music programs and a lot of those guys just just did their show as though they were in the studio but they were at home so they obviously had their turntables set up 
they had a mic set up and I thought that's a fun way of doing it because you get the live energy that you might have as though you're doing it in hmm, the studio yeah. rather than the pre-record style. Hmm. Yeah, well, it sounds like you, you've already got some equipment, which um, is a big start. Uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, so you just need uh, probably a, a bit of uh, acoustic material, whether it's just like just some curtains to make sure that the room is uh, not echoey. Mm. Uh, so yeah, don't do it in the bathroom. Uh, make sure it's in a, an, another room. Generally not in the kitchen either. <laughs> That's probably not a good room to do it in. Um, and yeah, and you just you you can play through into your mixer from your from your turntable or CD player, uh, and uh, record into your Audacity and just yeah, just go like as if it's live. Mm. Could I have my computer running and recording, like say I want to play stuff off my computer and record into my computer at the same time, or do I need two computers? Easy, it's easy if you've got two computers, but if you um, can have multiple um, channels of sound coming out of your computer, so that, um, you, know, you can get a like a USB interface that can send audio out of it, and then mm. also have audio coming into it, you can do both on the one computer. If the computer's got enough power, uh, this is one of the great things about how USB works. USB audio interfaces are pretty cheap. Uh, many USB sockets appear on almost every computer these days, and uh, a USB hub is sort of easy to connect and pretty painless. And every USB audio device that you plug in will simply appear um, if it's a Mac or if it's Windows. So there's no reason why you can't have any number of devices plugged in and you couldn't be playing out of one while you are recording on another. So, okay, multiple multiple interfaces. Now, of course, Geordie, something you're going to need at home is a decent sounding microphone. The master of the decent sounding microphone is Mr. Reynolds. Tell us about what you're wearing. Uh, well, what I'm wearing here is a rather old Sennheiser HME 25. So condenser, uh, close mic condenser, uh, very similar to the MKE 2s that you'll see on a lot of your television presenters and the like. Mm -hmm. uh, and then just a good set of closed back uh, uh, ear phones so you can see the side there. I always prefer closed back to uh, open back for uh, any studio work so you don't get feedback or whistle or anything like that coming back into the uh, into the microphone mm. or or bleed. So let's just have a listen to the difference between, for instance, the microphone that you're wearing, which is the, yep. the professional mic. Just talk. Mm. Uh, Mary had a little lamb. Okay. And now we hear Stephen saying the same thing. Mary had a little lamb. Does it sound completely different? Stephen is, of course, using the $2.50 earpieces from Aldi. <laughs> from no. Aldi. How oh, rude. Mm. Different. What are you using, Stephen? What are you using? These are Sennheiser, <laughs> inner, Sennheiser inner ear headphones. Okay. Um, and a... Oh, excellent. AKG 451. Is the 451 on as well? Yes. Oh, okay. Are you using okay. both mics or just the... Um... <clears throat> No, they're just headphones. They're and... just the headphones. Oh, and so yeah. the 451 is actually um, what you're recording. Well, there's a very good example of a room that's sufficiently dead that a distant mic is actually is sounding quite good. Yeah, oh, that's good. good. No, it, it sounds very nice. Mm. Um, Evan, would you like to talk for uh, Geordie? Yes, Mary had a little lamb. Okay, what do we know about shuttle. Evan's microphone? Where it's is perfect. Evan's microphone? <laughs> can you hear it? Oh, we can hear it. Oh, that's good. And that is a... Um, Next tech from Jayco. Okay, so it's a it's USB. a real microphone, but it's off to one side. You're not losing the laptop microphone. No, no, it's a USB okay. uh, mic. Ah, yeah. One of the biggest traps that I think we've all seen with people who are recording on Zoom, and you can do you can do great radio programs on Zoom, mm. is people who think they are using the headset mic and are actually uh, using the microphone in the laptop so that it sounds miles away. They think they're doing this, but they're actually doing that. Um, very easy way to check that, which is go and look at the settings. Just make sure you know which microphone you're using or play it back. And here we come to the trap that I was going to mention just before we shut down, which is 
you can use a machine to do playbacks while you're recording, but you have no way of knowing whether the recording has worked until you listen to it back. So if you do something on the machine that interrupts the recording, you might not know until after you've done a really wonderful two hour program. Yeah, I think my preference there uh, would be to use a, uh, a separate machine. Have one machine just for the recording that's sitting off to the side. You're going to have a lot better chance of getting a, a clean recording. You're not going to have an interrupt. You're not going to have some strange pop up or something like that, uh, slowing you down, stopping something, making a call on the processor. Don't take that risk and do the whole thing live like you are doing it in the studio, as uh, Geordie's saying. Mm. Uh, a, another handy thing to add uh, for your microphone, if you don't want to put too many things around the room, I'll just grab one here. Uh, one of these microphone uh, baffle things to go around the, uh, the back of the microphone on the stand. You can get a lot of deadening for the room. Mm. out of that so i think you can see that there yes mm. yeah. love that very got handy. a couple of those at cmto actually very handy very handy yep you so who wants to jump really... in and say why they're so important what are they actually doing stopping the echo reflection sound that's, reflection they're stopping the sound Noisy, reflection echoey room yeah so it, it might not be obvious, but um, directional microphones aren't completely directional. They are still susceptible to getting stuff that bounces off walls. And often people put microphones very close to walls. So you get a very close first reflection and having a baffle like that uh, helps deaden the effect of stuff coming in the back of the microphone. It can make an amazing difference to the quality of the sound, the pleasantness of the sound. There you go. All right, Jordy, have we answered your question? I think so. Um, I think I need a mic. I've got a bit of equipment already. Might be better off recording into maybe, maybe a Zoom recorder or something like that rather than using my computer. Um, yeah, I think that I'm probably ready to set it up. All I need now is a couple more cables to, you know, get it all um, hooked up together. Mm. I'm going to have a go. Can I and give you a couple of suggestions? Sure. Go ahead. Just, ha just happen to be on my left-hand side here. There's an $80 mixer. Oh, the, it, you believe it or not, your um, Zoom is, is taking that out. It thinks oh, it's no. background. Oh, I can see it now. Yeah, you can yep. see that. You can see it okay. now. Yep. So it's got the, it's got the knobs on it. Yep. Um, it's a uh, Behringer. Okay. $80 mixer. Bargain. I got mine up. A friend USB. just was going to throw it out, so she's just yep. given it to me. So I'm going to have a play with it. Yep. Um, we've actually got a couple of questions come through, um, through John. So um, I don't know All if right. we want to. Let's just to have not. have a look at where the. Oh, I see. They've gone into the question thing that, of course, vanished when, uh, when we restarted everything. Um, so Harry has said, thought it was best to have no room reverb and record the voice as dry as possible and then add warmth during processing, but he was scalded, possibly scolded, unless you were doing um, something where you were doing a, a broadcast into a kettle, uh, although that would add a lot of warmth. Uh, he was scalded more than once for the idea, suggesting it was inappropriate. Woo. Okay, well, which is better? Complete deadness and then adding something? Do you add warmth later? Mm. Mm. I would say live, a live room is better than adding to a like deaden it totally and then adding later. Mm. Yeah, it's mm. hard to emulate that sort of thing electronically. Stephen, you look like you're about to say something. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, it, a really, really dead room. Um, like an anechoic chamber, which is a real dead room, um, can actually take life out of the voice and what yeah. you're, you know, you're trying to project, and especially in a, you know, on air situation like that. Um, so yeah, so it is always good to have a little bit of liveliness room, but you know that can go to another extreme, which is then mm. you know very distracting. Yeah, I'd agree with that. A little bit live. Uh, yeah, don't try and add it afterwards. Uh, do it as, you, as you're doing it and listen to it and sh shape your sound as to what you're hearing in the headphones, not mm -hmm. trying to add into it later. Uh, that never worked. I mean, our, our best way that we ever used to monitor anything was when we were all analog all the way to the transmitter and you're listening back off air, whether it's AM or FM, to yourself through the processing there mm -hmm. and adjust your sound as to how you 
how you sound coming back through the uh, the off air chain. I, in fact, that's that's a skill that has really been lost because nobody is listening true off air anymore. You, know, you don't have any idea of what the processing is doing to your voice or the mix or anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, but anybody who was around in the old days, um, we learned to talk and use the limiter and processing chain as part of how we did the sound, mixing down, ducking, mm -hmm. um, talking over and, and hearing what the result was. And you sort of really can't do that anymore. Mm. Yes. Yeah, so wow. Similarly, I don't know if you remember John in in the old days uh, when when we would uh, send two different uh, pro or have two different processes uh, processor for the music processor for the for the voice and then mix them in the final stage of the limiter. Uh, you you were at a station that might have had somebody with golden tonsils and a gold plated microphone. Uh, yeah, he 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 didn't need the extra limiting. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't need limiting in any way. I, I think listening listening to this, and I've I've got some speakers running here for what's coming back to me on this. Stephen's voice actually sounds very pleasant. Given how how far away are you from the microphone there? About four hundred mils. Uh, yeah, about that much. Yeah, um, oh, that's actually sounding that's quite far. pleasant. Yeah. That's that's just a like an office study. Yeah, yeah. Carpeted. Yeah, carpeted. Yeah, on yeah. the floor. Yeah. Uh, one of one of the things that we do know acoustically, people say, oh, I've got to go and put uh, egg cartons on the walls and deaden that. In fact, um, that might not be the right answer. So Sonics foam or egg cartons doesn't necessarily improve the sound as much as what Stephen's got there, which is a room that has a lot of broken up surfaces. So if you're breaking up the, the reverb simply by having a lot of stuff, in there and it can be very it can be hard stuff but breaking up the sound so that you're not getting hard reflections it can sound quite pleasant so mm. probably to answer harry's question mm. the the warmth would come from having a reasonable sort of room in the first place yeah and i i've said to my wife the reason i've got to have all the trinkets is for acoustic reasons of course so, yeah that's of okay, course I'll, the, I'll just write that down thank you yeah the, the <laughs> on-air light there uh really just adds a little bit of warmth in the background yeah along with the light okay mm. um let's just uh so there's a couple of questions going up there all right so that's that's good um record with a blanket over your head and microphone actually uh john that's a good that's, option that's that's a great option and um that is used by several well-known broadcasters for doing uh very important daily heard podcasts so mm. i'm told reliably that that's how corona cast is recorded every day in order to uh, get the correct acoustic and not have lorikeets in the background which is a major <laughs> challenge that i have at my house uh, same here. I, I've mm. taken to recording things at 10 o'clock at night because it is so much easier to get rid of the noise when the, it isn't there. Mm. <laughs> yep. What about the plane going overhead? Uh, not so many planes these days. Yeah, that's Has happened. one good thing. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, something, actually a good, good tip if you're doing recording in a home, you know, like in a room at home, is, and, you, and it's, it's a recorded program that you can go and post-process later, is just record a track of silence just everything as it is without you making any noise at all and just record what the room sounds like without anything else happening mm. in audacity there is a reasonably good noise reduction yep. option that you can use it needs a little bit of tweaking sort of to back it off just a little if it's if it's mm. uh the settings are too high the sound can come out pretty unnatural. Just experiment with it. But basically, you grab a bit of your silence, put that into the processor, and say, now go and, and process all this out. And it will do a pretty good job of yeah. getting rid of continuous background noise. If you've got a computer or something else, air noise, whatever, it'll, yeah. it'll get rid of that. It won't fix lorikeets. Mm. Voice of experience. Um, OK, mm. now we, we had. Um, another uh, question come in via the question line today. So having talked about the home studio, let's talk about the studio that you're going to start up as a Greenfield studio. And this was a great question that came from Jenny Anderson in Canberra, who said, what would I put 
into a studio that I'm building today from the ground up. So, okay, let's let's run um, round, Evan. The sorry, studios... I'll just I'll just mention Jenny is in the room tonight. So if you want to chat to her, we can turn her mic on at any point too. Well, we'll answer the question first, and then we'll go and see if we got it right. Mm. How about that? So, uh, Evan, why don't you start? So, because you, you've been you you've been doing all these studios at remote locations, which are sort of really remote. Yes. Yes. Okay. What was the question? What would you put into a studio that you were building from scratch? From scratch. And so, why? Yeah, just from what I've done with all the remote communities. Um, um, especially, well, in the island, take that as an example. What I've done, I've got a, um, I put 14 studios up there, built 14 studios. Packaged, built them in cans, shipped them up, installed them. So what I did was give somebody a decent desk, not a table or something crappy looking thing. You know? Give them something that looks like a studio desk. So I had those manufactured locally. Mm. They just all flat pack, really neat. There was a box on the side, carried all the equipment just down underneath the desk, gear lift. Um, I used ELAN equipment for all the installations. Um, the distribution amp, the monitor amp, and the MP3 player, and the four channel switcher. I think that was it mm -hmm. for all of them. I had one computer, a desktop computer, but I had a rack mount computer in all this. Just get it off the desktop and get it away, just the box. Um, on the top, I had a box. Inside that was a couple of CD players. Um, they're still like mini disc. Mm. And, um, and, a, and a cassette player, because there's still a lot of cassettes floating around the islands. It's quite amazing. Yeah. yeah. And that was basically it, plus the switcher was up the top for the ELAN, which switched between the studio and satellite to the transmitter. Uh, um, and using, say, an eight channel mixer, like a, uh, the a, ELAN, a Merlin or a. No, the Falcon. Falcon, okay. Mm -hmm. Put Falcons in all the studios up there. We're going to do it. Let's do it properly. Yep. Yeah. And, um, and it turned out it was a good move because just the functionality of the, you know, that the Falcon gives you more. But the, mm. the eight channel Merlin's not bad either. But um, yeah, I put all those in anyhow and uh, gave them the opportunity of adding stuff later if they wanted to. And a couple of microphone boom arms, three microphone boom arms, two for guests, one for announcer, Sennheiser headphones, Sennheiser microphones, and then that's sort of gone over to AKG now as we replace them. They get knocked around. On the walls, I put... Um, where I could, the London kit, a very basic London kit, you know, the panels, mm. stuck them to the wall. And uh, that's for the acoustic deadening, which we were just talking about a moment ago. And just for an ordinary office room, it was nothing special, it wasn't built for studio. It was just an, um, an office room that the council said, here, you can have that, kick somebody out of there and we build a studio in it. So I had to put those panels up on the wall and it's quite effective, you know, in the front, in the back, that was enough. A bit of lively room, but, it, didn't it enough, but it sounded quite good on here. This sounds like a fairly typical studio. Like it's something that you could you could say an old school uh, announcer yeah. presenter might recognise. Yeah. Is there a trend towards less is is more? I mean, I've, I've we see plenty of st yeah. um, studios these days where there yeah. is nothing there except a panel, a computer, a couple of screens, and two microphones or three microphones. Exactly. And that's where, you know, from doing that job, that's just one contract or project I did. But mm. to come from that now, yeah, I wouldn't do that again. Yeah. I t a more simplified approach, what you're talking about. Simple mixer on the desk, um, no big boxes or anything all over the place. Right. And um, a couple of mics and uh, probably a streaming box, which I've been putting in. And yeah, that's about it. And, okay. give, them, and give also what's important, I've noticed. They've always wanted an external input, must have, because everyone's wondering about their laptop and a player ah, and a yes. Zoom recorder, and they want to just plug it in and play it. You know, they don't want to go the process of putting on a computer, you know, editing it, getting it all nice and then playing it later. They just want to plug mm. in and play. Okay. And just keeping it simple like that. Right. Yeah, that's what I do. Okay. Stephen, 
Well, what were your thoughts when you when you saw the question? Um, one of the things I think uh, Jenny was asking was about remotely controlling the the uh, mixer as well. Um, mm. So you would generally you would look at then a, maybe a digital desk uh, to be able to do that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And um, yeah, so that th if I was building, you know, multi studio place um with a couple of studios two or three i'd probably be look at some form of digital desk um the installation would be a, a lot quicker because you're using um network cable and um you know, yeah and being able to interconnect everything and uh and be sharing devices across multiple studios um very easily uh yeah, and so then that gives you the the um, ability to remotely control that desk if there's a lockdown or something like that. Is that is that what you did at Hope? Yeah, yeah, we we um we have yeah digital studios, and um, one of actually our projects next year is to actually refit um, two on air studios uh, due to the age of the equipment and. Um, but yeah, we, we can actually remotely control, if you like, a virtual cons console layout on a computer and mm. turn channels on and off and fade channels up and down uh, uh, remotely. So uh, we have used that a little bit, um, but fortunately with lockdowns and that sort of stuff, we we're still able to have at least a couple of people in the studio as in, mm. in the facility. Mm. Have you ever gone the whole hog where you've provided somebody off site with a control surface that effectively gives them, uh, you know, hands on faded knob driven control of the gear in the studio? Uh, not necessarily. No, not really. <laughs> um, yeah, with uh IT wise and security and that sort of stuff, it, it's um, difficult to do. Makes it a bit more complex. Uh, yeah. especially... But you could you could do that if you wanted to. You yeah, could presumably yeah. with with these consoles. Uh, apart from the fact you have to get your microphone in somehow or other, presumably all your sources could be in a remote studio, and the control surface could be and and a couple of inputs microphones, yeah. particularly could be somewhere else. A, a few a few of the brands now um, do have uh, a virtual console that can be it is just like a HDMI mm. HTML5 interface, and so <laughs> people are able to control that from home, and yeah, and you could have their mics feeding to the um, station, and they're just turning themselves on and off and right. and firing off their automation system, which is can be remotely controlled as well. Uh, and away you go. It's a bit, bit bizarre thinking, <laughs> thinking of running the entire studio console um, with, as you say, HTML5 and a bit of REST uh, protocol mm. and actually telling it what to do remotely. Uh, Al, mm. what, what have, have you seen? Um, have you seen this happening in the in the areas you've been working? Yeah, certain, certainly in commercial, there's uh, there has been a little bit of a trend towards uh, going to uh, say a, a virtual console on a uh, a glass desktop like a uh, a large Microsoft Surface or something mm. like that, which uh, it, it has some advantages. It's uh, but I think as well in a, a true live situation, there's some disadvantages which often get overlooked. Now, one of the great things of uh, doing any live show for a presenter, if you're panelling, is being able to rest your hands on a real console and having the tactile thing there. Now, you can't mm. exactly rest your fingers on the fader of a virtual console on a Microsoft Surface uh, or on a, an on-off button or something like that yeah. to turn somebody on and off. Yeah. I still think the tactile surface is an important part of it. Uh, the... Um, uh, I think as well for building a studio, say, in a remote situation like Evan's been building as well, we need to think about who's going to be able to maintain it and yep. get it running again or reset it uh, in a situation. Uh, I've seen Steve, Steven Studios uh, mm. with a, a large digital uh, system, same as many most of the commercials, where you've got full-time technicians there all the time yep. to be able to do anything you need to. But if you're, you've got a remote site, sometimes you want to just keep it analog so you can turn it off and on. 
Yeah, mm. exactly. And it's that, that was my argument too. Mm. Those things are like a bit of old farm machinery. You just put them in, they just go forever, you know? Yep. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I was going to say, I think this might be a good time. Geordie, why don't we just bring Jenny in if she'd like to sort of pop in. Um, we've been sort of commenting and, and riffing on her question. Uh, Jenny, how close did we get to the right answer or an answer at all? Well, I was hoping you'd tell me the right answer, but <laughs> um, no, it's a really good food for thought there. Um, lots, of, lots to take in still, of course, but... Do you have any particular studio in mind? So when you ask the question, it was a very Greenfields, very open question. Mm. Is this something that you are about to about to do? Well, we're actually hoping to sort of tear down our current studio and build a new room and build everything up. And most of the equipment that we've got in the current studios is probably so old, it's not worth transferring over. So I'm really just starting to think, well, again, it, I've been, we've been looking at this for the last year, but mm. I'm, I'm wanting to move forwards and actually just lock in, okay, which bits can we keep? Which ones are useful? Which ones do we need to um, update, improve, change? Okay. All right, fine. What have you got at the moment? What, what sort of consoles do you know? Uh, we have an Elan in one of the studios and an Axia in the other. Mm. So we have got... Okay. Yeah. It sounds like you're therefore already on the way to doing doing something. You've got the toe in the water with, with digital. Mm. Yes. Which is the on-air uh, main one, the Axia? Yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And so the Elan's what? That's production? I uh, know it's our secondary studio. So, okay. Um, yeah. Well, all right. Let's just move the discussion very slightly while we've got you online. What do your presenters prefer? Have, do, do they have... Do they have any qualms, firstly, moving to a new console at all, the Axia? And then the question is, do they, over time, develop a preference for one or the other? I think most of them have actually now been trained on the Axia. So that's only the ones that have been around for a very long time who understand the Elan one. Um, because <sighs> usually we use the main studio. They mm. don't, haven't okay. really heard any preferences. <laughs> Okay, fair enough. Yeah. No preferences. Hear that, everybody? Analog yes. versus digital? Mm -hmm. No preferences. Mm -hmm. Sample of one. <laughs> very, very important uh, survey that we've just mm -hmm. run there. Uh, Jenny, thank you very much for that question, by the way. It was really good. Yeah, just one other question, though, to Jenny. What, what's your budget? Uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes. As little as possible, but we have some money. Yep, no, that's all. Not, not give us a figure, but all I'm saying is um, a suggestion like as a tech, I always ask them that. What, yep. what figure am I working to? And what do you want? And then all right, Evan, let's put you on a spot. If, yep. if what, what figure should you be budgeting for a new studio mm. these days? Base stuff, before you put any gear in it, before oh. you just, because because we know what a CD player costs, bang, that's yeah. what it costs. But but just for the studio, monitoring the desk, console, what's a good number? I'd probably put away about 15,000. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Could do something good for that. Massively cheaper than television. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, the sky's the limit, of course. But if you say 15,000, you could come up with a really flash, you know, operating mm. studio without going over the top with all the expensive gear. Mm. Um, yeah, you could be done. Yeah. There's been an interesting trend I've noticed. By the way, thank you very much, Jenny. Um, so we'll just, uh, we'll pop you out. Really appreciate you joining us tonight on Chump the Stumps or the other way around. <laughs> so um, uh, microphones. There's a perennial topic. Um, Al sort of talked about headphones before, and we, we had a little bit of a listen to a couple of different microphones. Uh, the um, uh, microphones, what do we think? What sort of microphones should people be putting into a studio? How much money should you spend? Who wants to go? Oh, come on, we've got <laughs> five people here. Somebody's got a preference. Uh, I have a preference for uh, usually a Sennheiser, still like a Sennheiser 421 for an announcer's microphone or mm -hmm. a uh, mm -hmm. uh, Electra Voice RE uh, 20. RE 20. RE 20 mm -hmm. or, or the 
what's their uh, new one? The RE 320. 320. Uh, 321s, mm. they're quite mm. good. Uh, I believe a lot of stations are using uh, the road copies of the RE 20, uh, RE 320s these days. Mm. Uh, Personally, not as big a fan of this fan of their sound. I think the Sennheisers and the uh, uh, and the Electra Voice sound better, uh, which is why so many people have used them for so many years. Uh, That's a really really interesting point there because the four twenty one has been around since nineteen sixty well, something, probably sixty four. Yeah, um, that that is the one I believe that um, John Laws has had gold plated. At four twenty-two. He always oh, a four. Oh, he had a four twenty-two. Had a four twenty-two. He's yeah. still using that. Okay. I, I had that made for him in nineteen ninety-four. A gold plated four twenty-two. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, four twenty-two is a slightly different microphone, but the the four twenty-ones. I mean, many stations still had these, and um, I find it interesting that every so often I'll, I'll see a grant application where somebody say, "Oh, you know, these microphones are very old; they need replacing." How old does a microphone have to be before it needs replacing, or how old does it have to be before it's a classic and you couldn't possibly part with it because it sounds so good? Stephen, you clearly know something. Uh, no, I've just I've, I've got a couple of uh, RCA um, ribbon mics. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes. Which, uh, don't, ago, don't, people... don't say that too loud in front of Al because we yeah. know what will happen. No, turn back, <laughs> face the camera. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, it's, it's all going to come out now. <laughs> yes. Um, so yes, they hang on to the for a while and they do become a yes like that. Um... <laughs> Hi there, Al. <laughs> um yes. generally they have I, a sound. <laughs> yeah i mean these days my preference uh, i yeah I, I i like the road mics um well, you know i think hope has 24 something road broadcaster microphones Broadcast. throughout so that's that's the condenser microphone that's the one that has the little light on it that doesn't yeah. do anything particularly useful but <laughs> well it shows that there's phantom power but you can also Put a uh, five pin um, XLR on it, and you can control mm. the the um, little light. The light um, yeah. <laughs> um, and what I've recommended to some stations uh, when they haven't got the best acoustics is that um, they look at the Rode um, Procaster, which is the dynamic, dynamic mic really version. Um, so it sounds pretty similar um but uh just yeah it's not as sensitive so it doesn't pick up as much of the room okay yeah i mean any real preference between condenser mics and dynamic mics i especially for fm i i prefer the condenser mic uh it mm. just gives a little bit more of a sparkle in the voice um yeah so i did do tests with re20s a few years ago now and um i just found them a little bit dull um you'd have to do a bit of eqing and um, processing to um just give them that um sort of sound it's probably an interesting technorama thing um one day probably a sydney technorama where we actually have the hardware handy uh to do a bit of a shootout um i i know uh from my personal experience that there is no one microphone fits all solution and some of the best microphones you could possibly have don't do particularly well in a bad acoustic or where there is a lot of air movement uh, a u87 or some of the calrec microphones are just incredibly sensitive to air noise so you just don't want to put them anywhere that where there's a uh, an air conditioning draft and dynamic microphones tend to be less sensitive to such things but uh, a lot of people have said they really like the Rode uh, broadcaster mics uh, and they're pretty good value. Um, but as, as Al said, there's still a lot of people who, who go for the Sennheisers. Mm. So, um, there's probably no one size fits all solution, a bit like pickup cartridges and a bit like uh, loudspeakers. And I think we will always mm. have preference <laughs> discussions about those. Mm. Let's move to just go on, Jody. We've got a hand up from Vincente. Um, I think it's Raul, actually. Um, and um, I'm just wondering, should we should we see Look, if let's. Uh, this is stump the chumps. We're yeah. in for anything. Let's find out, caller. Although the seven second dump button has been connected, <laughs> go ahead. You're on the air. 
Raul, is that you? Yeah, can you hear me? We, we can. can. Oh, hi everyone. How are you today? We are good. Good, good. I have a, a different question because uh, I am the station manager for, for Radio Skill Row, but the problem that I have at the moment is finally we finished the installation with the MBN connection from our site that is located in Markville uh, to Chang Ho. Yep. Yeah. But <laughs> the problem that I have is uh, before to finish the installation with the MBN connection, I put my laptop in the town hall in, that is located in the antenna in the level 26. But after that, when I connect the Thailand, the audio code, yeah, yeah, uh, it's still the signal with a lot of interference. I don't mm. understand what happened yet. Somebody can recommend me about a uh, very good Thailand or. Well, let, let's just have a look at what you're doing. So firstly, yeah. you're, you're, what I'm understanding is you're using a tie line yeah. to get the program from the studio to the yeah. transmitter site. Exactly. And it is over a digital network? No, it's not a digital. It's a, a, um, analog. Well, the, if you're using a tie line, I assume that what's in the middle is, is digital network. Oh yeah, yeah, but but the thing exactly, but uh, I Correct. connect, yeah, I connect yeah, in so, the stereo, yeah. Okay, so uh, that's a very common situation. So you have an analog input, you have an analog output, you have some digital stuff in the middle. Yeah. What exact problem are you hearing? The problem is, uh, for example, and it's not the range, but it's a lot, of, a lot of interference and noise. Hmm. For example, is the, the the sign, the the signal is very good only in the Marrickville area, but if you go like Kingrove that is inside the, 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 the range, appear like a different kind of, of noise, like a static noise. Okay. But, but, that, but that only is the problem with the timeline, but no with the, for example, when I used the laptop, it was totally different. The, the sound was perfect, it was amazing. So when you say using the laptop, do you mean listening off your stream? Yes, exactly. Because the problem that they have is in the level 26, we don't have, before, we don't have any connection about the internet. Yeah. So the only, the only point that I have was to, to buy the modern 4G to connect my laptop, to put the stereo output with the streaming directly to the antenna. This is um this is sounding like a very very complex question with much yeah. nuancing. It's probably probably going to be very difficult to deal with here. What I thought you were talking about uh, initially was that the signal is getting to the transmitter, and then as you moved around the service area, in some places it sounded all right, in other places it doesn't, yes, which would be an RF problem, a transmission problem. But hmm. then you're saying that it it is different when you use the different audio connection. Yeah, it's correct. For example, okay, uh -huh. let's let's throw that out and see if we can tease out anything. Al, what questions are you going to ask Raul to try and work out what problem we've got here? Uh, well, certainly if you if your difference around the transmission area, are you is your transmitter running at its uh, its normal rated power? Are you having any reflection issues or anything like that? Is it yeah. a problem with the antenna? Um, because I, I cannot see how it would be anything more than an, uh, an RF fault or a, uh, a transmission fault. If it sounds good somewhere and it doesn't sound good somewhere else, somewhere else. when you're further away, then it's, uh, it's fairly, fairly logical that it would be uh, the transmission. Mm. Yeah. Do you think that maybe it's because now we are using the fiber connection um, and the timeline that is the audio code is, is all? Maybe no, 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 no. Because if it if it was clean coming out of the tie line and going into the transmitter, uh, presumably you're using the stereo generator in the transmitter, or is there another audio processor of some sort, uh, as a, uh, say a uh, a BW broadcast or an Optimod or something like that, or an Omnia that's doing the processing and then feeding in a. Um, uh, uh, an MPX signal into the transmitter or you're going left and right into the transmitter directly. Mm -hmm. And is there any limiting or anything like that? In, sorry, in, in our, in our tie line. Uh, no, no, but be, is what, what's between the tie line and the transmitter itself? Okay. Uh, 
answer answer the question, and then I I think I I have a way out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat the question because I can. Listen, yeah. sorry. Is 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 uh, you have a tie line? Is yeah. the tie line feeding the transmitter directly? Yes, correct. Okay, so there is no form of processing or limiting between the tie line and the transmitter. No, we don't have that one. Only one exciter. That's it. Okay. Mm. Is is the exciter have any inbuilt processing or limiting? Limiting. It, it just has limiting, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering if you're perhaps overdriving the inputs yes. or something like that, which would cause yeah. distortion. Sounds like it. Could be. I, look, I'm going to suggest this is this is one of those questions where probably what we want to do is put you back to the switchboard. We'll get your name and address, and we'll take this up offline. But this is actually a good question to ask on Q and A in the Facebook group, and uh, probably the first thing we want to do is move into a, a visual block diagram so that we can see um, what technology you've got. I, I think the thing that we would all be able to say is that if you've got a digital link. And it doesn't matter what the digital link, it doesn't matter whether it's fiber or it's DSL or anything else. Um, the link itself is unlikely to be a problem unless it's, it's, it's a bit constrained. It is just going to be digits. So whatever you've got leaving the studio should be arriving at the transmitter. Yeah. Can the, I, the, on, the only thing I'd add to that is uh, what particular uh, uh, audio codec you're using within the uh, the tie line if you're using a low bit rate say only a 64 mm. kilobit or 128 kilobit where if you've got 64. the bandwidth 64, yeah. 64 okay yeah. 64 kilobits is not enough mm. you you really shouldn't be using anything below 256 256 uh 256. joint stereo okay. mi minimum minimum, yeah. minimum okay preferably okay. uncompressed Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate, I appreciate for, for that. But, but look, this is a great question uh, to, to try and unpack in the Q&A mm. forum because the entire Brains Trust will be there and we'll be, we'll be happy to uh, throw in. Uh, Are you awesome. in the Q&A on Facebook, question. Raul? Yep. And if you don't know how to get to the Q&A group, this is assuming you're a Facebook user, that's sort of where it is at the moment. Might mm. change in the future, but it's where it is at the moment. If you go to the Technorama website, technorama.org.au, and right up the top right-hand corner, you will see the little logo that says Q&A on FB for Technorama. And just click there. That will take you to sign up or it'll take you to the page. Mm. I now, had a, um, a left field thought. Um, if because he said that it sounded fine when the internet stream was going into the transmitter, but when the mm. tie line went in, it had issues. Was mm. that maybe the uh, audio that's feeding the tie line at the studio might have a phase issue, and so the tie line would cope with that? Mm. Possible. Mm. Uh, certainly, one of the first things you learn about FM is that if you've managed to invert one of the phases, you'll get something that might sound vaguely okay in stereo, but as mm. soon as you switch to mono, uh, there will be no voice. There'll be Some nothing the from voice. the center. Yeah. Disappears in the back. Mm. Yep, gone. Mm. And uh, and that's sort of how it works. And algorithms don't like uh, you know, encoding out of phase no, either. So certainly you know, don't. On no. a tie line. Mm. Do you? But one other thing with the algorithms as well, uh, attention has to be given to what your source material is. Uh, there's a tendency to play things that are from low bit rate AAC or MP4 or MP3, whichever, which then get re-encoded in another algorithm as they go through the mm. tie line. And you're going to get a concatenation there, which will mm. severely degrade the audio. Same thing happens on DAB when people are using low bit rate on DAB, mm. playing something back off YouTube, it can sound really bad. Mm. A can of worms that I don't want to open up here, but certainly something that was discussed uh, in the last sort of week and a half, two weeks on Q&A, was use of music from um, unofficial sources. So what happens if you take a piece of music that you, you might want to use in a program, uh, but you play it back from Spotify, or you, t you record it from Spotify and then play it back. Uh, and of course, that discussion very quickly becomes uh, forked. There are two, two parts to the discussion. One is, what is the quality? So as Al says, you talk about uh, concatenation errors, uh, what happens when you have something that is compressed, fed into another codec, fed into another codec, it can sound really disgusting very quickly. Uh, so that's, that's one 
uh, challenge. The other challenge, of course, is the legal challenge. Are you allowed to do this? Something that as technologists, we probably don't want to enter into, and we certainly don't want to be the thought police. But you need to be aware that material can be watermarked, and the watermarking is incredibly robust. So it will survive um, bad processing, numbers of concatenated codecs, and they can still say, yeah, you got this from Spotify, didn't you? Yeah. Mm. Yep. And that, that is our mm, Definitely is there. I'd and love to go back to a MTA question. Training, if you would like to learn more about that <laughs> and the pitfalls of using things off YouTube and Spotify. Ah. Oh, that'll mm. be in the uh, CMTO legal training that will be running over Christmas time, where you can get the free pass just by saying, I heard about this on uh, Q and on the uh, uh, Stump the Jumps. Tuesday. Stump yes, the Jumps. on Technorama yep. Tuesday. We've got a few so, yeah. questions hanging around in the Q&A yeah. box. Yeah, um, sure. A question that came up earlier, and, and this was the interesting one. Uh, Richard Shearer asked, good evening, Richard, asked why a live internet audio stream can sometimes be heard several minutes after it's broadcast? Is it caching on the listener's device? Actually, we probably, probably need a little bit more there. So... The question is, is, is that a fault or is that working as designed? So, for example, um, our, our factum expert here, Mr. Reynolds, mm -hmm. what would be the typical propagation delay from the time you feed audio into DAB encoder or for actually out of the studio until you hear it come out of a radio? Uh, your typical setup on a uh, most factum systems is about ten seconds. About 10 uh, you seconds. can you can shorten that by reducing some of the uh, the buffering between the different stages. As you uh, you bring your audio in, you encode the audio, you insert your uh, your slideshow and the like. Uh, I think the shortest we've managed to get it down to is about three three and a half seconds. But then you're removing some of the uh, the buffering and the error correction there. So most people tend to leave it standard around 10 seconds. Mm. So that's that's three seconds from the time you feed audio in until the time a high efficiency HEAAC or, or the, the codec that's used for DAB plus comes out the other yep. side. Mm. That's yep. a, at what bit rate? 64K? Uh, any, any of the bit rates are going mm. from uh, 16 kilobits up to 128. It'll That's all be the... about the same. Most of the delay is actually in the, uh, as it passes the different stages between the service multiplexer and the ensemble multiplexer, which are deliberately put in there. And also to add timing and a uh, and guard timing for the transmission as mm -hmm. all of the DAB, uh, pack, I'll call them packets, uh, time stamped for the actual transmission time with an absolute time for transmission. Mm -hmm. So, so taking this back to the, the sort of vaguely non-technical way in which the question was asked, hmm. why would a live stream be several, heard several minutes after it's broadcast? So the first thing is I'll express a little bit of surprise that hmm. the encoding is that quick, but that's a sort of high-powered um, hardware encoding. I think software hmm. encoding would be much, much longer. Uh, it, that's actually software encoding. Okay. So, so the uh, uh, DAB usually uses, uh, in the case of all the uh, the Factum, uh, Pineda, and the other ones at the moment in Australia, uh, using a Fraunhofer MP. Oh, sorry, AAC plus encoder, mm -hmm. and that's pretty well the uh, the time for that. You very powerful computers these days, but even on the uh, the much earlier uh, computers that we use for doing that encoding, a similar sort of time. Okay. Um, Evan and, and Stephen, um, encode times on streams, what, what do you see normally? Um, yeah, look, the streams that I've set up and been dealing with, it's um, a lot of the stuff via satellite because you have to because of remote areas. Mm -hmm. um, some of those dial up and gone. Most of those, they finished just about all the tire lines. Just about got rid of all those. But um, and if I can get a good connection somewhere on the stream box that I've been setting up anyways, we you know, I've told you about the Raspberry Pis. Mm. You can get them down at know, 20, 30 milliseconds or somewhere right over there. They're pretty good. That, that's yeah. very fast. Over the satellite though, how about 680 milliseconds? 
680 millisecond. Well, the, and the satellite itself would be a quarter of a second of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a typical sort of figure I've noticed across the satellite, NBN satellite from the remote islands. Mm. And, of course, that's no good for, as we know, for you can't, headphones can't on and talking and listening back and going. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But I've, I've, got, I've managed to get over uh, just the data links, mm. um, point to points and all those sort of data links, um, streaming. It's got it down pretty good and people who have been using it, you know, 10, 15 milliseconds and it's not bad. You can still monitor off air and still talk and just hear it slight, just a slight echo, you know, but few people like to operate like that. The, the phasing effect that you hear in your head when the sound is sort of somewhere between 10 and um, mm. 18 milliseconds delayed, mm. which you can hear and nobody else can. That's right. <laughs> Very yeah. exciting effect. Yeah, yeah. Julie, I wonder if we might get Richard in just to um, uh, see if he would like to expand on the question because I'm intrigued by the way he asked it. Um, when Whenever you do any sort of encoding, delay comes with the territory as soon as you put forward error correction in which you would do on the internet to ensure that the signal is robust there is more delay added but richard you you were talking as sort of several minutes that sounded a bit unusual so so what sort of situation are you talking about yeah i'm not talking about dab i'm talking about um um an internet stream through a mobile phone or whatever and i've had the situation and on more than one station where I was listening uh, and then I turned it off, turned it back on again, and it resumed from where I turned it off. Mm. Ah, I've, that's a different effect, of course. Yeah, mm. I've experienced that with tune-in apps and mm -hmm. uh, that has happened. I mean, Maybe caching on your um, computer. That's what I thought. I thought it must be that, but I wasn't, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't sure why it was so, you know, because it seemed to be uh, caching a lot of material. Mm. I would expect a limitation to that. So there are plenty of players which when you hit the stop button or the pause button, when you release that, it's like a thawing process. So they pick up where they left off. But if you did that for some very large amount of time, that can only be achieved by buffering somewhere. And, yeah. and sooner or later, that would become an embarrassment. Mm. You would expect the process to uh, sort of dump, uh, dump the stream possibly disconnect you, do something like that. But but two minutes, this is, um, you, you, you're not talking about um, a stream that is typically many minutes late under all circumstances? No, 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 no. Okay. No, I'm just, I'm, that's a very specific um, situation where where it was, when it was playing, I turned it off, turned it back on, and it resumed from, basically from where I was listening to it previously, although, you know, it was, mm. the actual broadcast <laughs> moved on. You would expect that to be caching at the device. It's very unlikely yeah. that a uh, service is going to be handled, able to handle a large number of users if it cached your individual stream to, mm. to order in the network. Sure. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Most, most typical internet streaming is by the time it's encoded and decoded on someone's phone or laptop is anywhere from 10 to 30 seconds. Yes. Mm. Yeah, depending on what hosting you're using, and yeah, that sort of thing. Yeah, especially as well if you're um, if you're not listening to it, say directly. I, I'm not sure how Stephen does uh, hope, but if you're not listening directly from the sources encoding, if you're coming through some sort of an aggregator or something like that, mm -hmm. you, you may get a, a considerable delay through the aggregator, particularly if the aggregator is attempting to insert alternative commercials or sponsorship. Yeah. Certainly one of the things that surprised me in the very early days, uh, I was uh, doing the engineering for a community station here in Sydney, and we uh, we started doing AAC plus or HEAAC plus encoding on our stream at 32 K bits. Well before DAB came up, we thought that was a good compromise uh, in internet plans of the day. And so we're talking here about uh, oh, early, early 2000s, um, just before DAB started. 
And the quality was surprisingly good on the stream, especially at, at 32K bits. It was amazingly good for 32K bits, better than anything else we could have used to deliver at that, that speed, uh, to the extent that I kept forgetting that I was listening to the stream. Uh, it was leaving me wondering why, why the news was starting 25 seconds late at the top of the hour until I reminded myself, of course, you're listening to the stream. It started on time. And the stream was about 25 seconds of delay through a, a very through a software encoded process, entirely software encoding. So that added quite a bit of time um, on the machines we had available at the time. Hmm. Cool. All right. Um, just sort of wondering, um, uh, wondering what other questions. You've still got a little time if you um, if you have a burning desire to discuss something. John Hoskin sort of moved the question about the studio on one step further and said, "Well, what would you do for an internet studio?" Mm. Which sort of sounds a bit like what Geordie was talking about, except presumably the uh, one more step. It's it's going to be live, and it's going to be connected to some device that will will feed forward. So what what devices would you use? How how if you want to deliver straight to the internet or you want to deliver over the internet to another studio, what would you do? I was just wondering what what type of studio is John talking about? Is an internet studio is he a home studio or he wants to set up a full broadcast studio for his station over the internet? He didn't yeah. actually say. He just it's said, um, "What I'm equipment would you need in. for an internet studio?" But John, you could actually online. tell us directly, couldn't you? Tell us what yeah. you want. Yeah, well, up at the radio station that I'm with, uh, TCHR, we uh, there's a few announcers who are wanting to go uh, live streaming, but they also what they're wanting to do is um, record from their home, so that they don't have to go in the studio because we've got uh, announcers that live in Newcastle and and all over the place and the studios at Cessnock. So they want to stay at home and actually record like a, uh, an internet radio station without having the FM, you know, but mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm a bit, I don't know which way to go with that or, you know, because I know that some of the people from TCHR are listening here as well. So if, you know, if you can give some ideas, that'd be great. It sounds pretty much like the the question we were answering earlier for for Jordy mm. with her home studio, because it still comes down to what media do you want to play. So, for example, if you have a large personal library of CDs, you will probably want a mixer and two CD players so that you can bounce from one to another. So, the very the most basic studio you could have would probably be a microphone, a mixer two CD players, and then if you want to do integration, you want to be able to play stings, you want to be able to uh, play some spots maybe in live or bits of overlay music, you might have uh, an additional computer or a, or a third CD player and, and you play the tracks off that. It's actually good, worth remembering that for doing stuff from home, um, in the absence of having a computer to, to play spots back or a mini disc, you happen to still have it, they're, they're quite good, but you can always take tracks and any uh, music burning or video burning uh, program will create a CD that just has lots of tracks on it and you play those tracks out of your additional machine. Mm. Um, just the way we used to with, uh, with cartridges. Yeah, that's right. How yeah, do you we'll... get it onto the internet? Yeah, I was just thinking that the cheap, simple way of doing that. What do you got there, John? A Windows box for the... Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've got a Windows box here. Yeah, most of the other um, people have got Windows. Okay. Yeah, we, we, okay. We, we steer clear from Apple, so... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, look, real simple solution for that one, John. What I'd do, sitting at home there, all the equipment that, um, that was described then and we talked about in the past, all the bits and pieces, as I say, that $80 mixer, that'd be a fine one. Um, it's USB, feed that into your Windows box, set up Edcast on the um, desktop, load up Icecast uh, streaming server, and you're away. Yep, sounds good. Yeah. That's if you're going to stream yourself. Yeah, that's yeah, if you want that's to stream. Right. Yeah, that's right. And the studio yeah. can pick that back up and broadcast it for you. Or you can just broadcast live to the world from your computer at home. But be aware for a lot of connections. 
<laughs> your computer might get swamped. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Well, yep. Does yeah, that cost so money, Evan, to get it on Icecast? Sorry to get it on Icecast? Does it cost money to no. put it up on that's, Icecast? That's, Icecast is free software. Free software. It's a streaming application, drives the Edcast. Edcast is free. Two free applications and you're up and running. And well, what, it, then, what, it, what Evan was referring to there is if you do that, you are effectively becoming the server. That means everybody yep. who tunes in, everybody who connects to your service is now starting another stream that is leaving your, your place mm -hmm. and going up whatever your connection is. So if you happen to have, um, let's, let's say you were going to run uh, a codec at uh, 128K, so you're going to get eight streams per megabit. Um, a typical NBN connection, you might have a 20 megabit uplink service or a 50 megabit uplink service. You would probably therefore be able to handle, you know, 15, 20, 30 streams leaving your house. Hmm. You might find your ISP getting a bit annoyed with you for doing that if you do it forever, hmm. uh, but you, you could yeah. be doing that. That's a quick, dirty yeah. solution to it. Yeah. So oh, yes. my broadcasters could be in Newcastle and ice casting to the studio in Cessnock. Yeah, you could do that. Yeah, that's, just that's, that's, that's basically yeah. what they wanted to do. Yeah. Okay, so you want to go back to the studio. That's the same yeah. time. Don't advertise it to the world. Your yes. IP address in the port, just give it to your studio. They lock in there another computer and there's your stream. Sound, sounds good. There is there is an alternative. There There is a cloud-based system called CleanFeed. Mm -hmm. uh, where you just yep. use web browsers at both ends yep. and you don't have to install any um, software or set anything mm. up and you yep. can do a point-to-point -point connection that way as mm. well. Yeah. Mm. Um, and that probably gets around all the questions of licensing because nobody can, if you're using CleanFeed, nobody can claim that you are a broadcaster and therefore subject to uh, licensing implications of the material that you're broadcasting. Mm. Yeah. I've just popped Icecast and Clean Feeds URLs into the chat box too, if anyone's interested to mm. look at that. Again, they're very good questions uh, if, if you want an expansion on that. Uh, drop into Q&A. Um, that, that, there are some perennial questions that, that come up. How do I link is one of them. It pops up every so often. Facebook does not make it easy to search back historically, which is one of the challenges and the rods we have to bear um, using Facebook. Uh, but the, the discussions have happened a number of times. So jump into Q&A, just scroll back, scroll back, scroll back. You, know, you might find a couple of gems or, or uh, search in the doesn't work very well, very limited uh, search capability that is there. Try keywords, you might or might not get lucky. Excellent. Um, thank you very much for popping that in, Geordie. Look, I'm I'm not seeing any any burning uh, matters coming up uh, right now. I think um, I did before we go. There's a couple of things that um, I sort of wanted to point out. One, um, Evan's excellent work. So there's been this big Skunk Works project that's been running in background to develop further uh, some uh, projects that Evan was working on using Raspberry Pis. Um, have you actually got any any bits there in the studio with you at the moment? You could um, hold up to the camera that will turn them into background. You can see. No, we'll try. How about that? It I turns it into background. Ah, there ah you go. yeah. Okay, we can see that. Sitting in a JCAR box. It's a streaming server, complete right. streaming server. All you got to do is press the power button. It finds its corresponding receiver at the other end. Mm -hmm. Green light comes on. We're talking to each other. That's all you want the, the, the broadcaster wants to know. It does the rest automatically. Is And that's what's on the back. On the back, the LAN connection. In the LAN, it's a USB audio card. That's the Behringer UCA222. Stripped down and shoved in the back of the box. Audio in, audio out. Pretty simple, but that's what I'm putting out on the islands and it's going over the satellite. And the quality of it, 120OK, it's not bad, you know. I've got to be careful about the bandwidth, that's all, because it's, you know, on the satellite, it chews it up like crazy and they can't afford it. So I, got, I had to pull everything back and running at 128K, it's going beautifully. And then I'll, I'll ask the question. Back of the hub studio. Yeah, I'll, I'll ask the question. Do you conveniently have the lid unscrewed just so you can show us what's inside the box? Don't go away. 
Okay, while uh, Emily's doing that, a very exciting project that we've got, and this is uh, we were doing this in conjunction with CMTO. Um, we we have some funding to run some uh, Raspberry Pi how-to classes, and we were planning to do this in a number of parts of the country. Uh, the challenge was we got the funding, and then of course COVID shut down the country. We're currently working out how to do this and when. But uh, coming to a training establishment near you sometime in the next six months, look out for the opportunity to go and learn a bit hands-on uh, about Raspberry Pi and how it can be used. Um, Evan and, uh, and also Terry O'Connor um, in Brisbane have been working on some Raspberry Pi based projects. So Evan with his control system that he's, he's used for the islands and mm. Terry has been working on point to point links that you can just treat as a hardware project. Um, just hold that up. Okay. Zoom, Zoom is doing its best. Yeah, to, I know. There. Yeah, to there. turn that out on you, but. Yep. So there you go. There's the Raspberry Pi. That's all. It's very simple, very basic. And the <laughs> audio card down there near the sockets? Audio card, that's that's the Behringer audio card with it, right. all its covers off and just bolted to the deck. Hmm. And uh, that's all you need. Looks looks very pleasant. What sort of power goes into that? Uh, five volt. Okay. That's it. Five volts in. And the software is, is really good. It was developed by a guy, um, engineer from the BBC in England, mm -hmm. a few, couple of years ago called OpenAB. Mm -hmm. um, people may have heard about it. But it's using uh, GStreamer with some Python on top of it as the interface, and it's really good. And those two boxes just, you just, all I have to do is just press a button at each end and they just lock, start streaming, everything's automatic, don't touch a thing. Auto configured. And just quickly, up at, just came back from Grid Island, and that's the Raspberry Pi 7 inch touchscreen. Hmm. hmm. Might be a bit blurry. If you want to go directly to air, you just touch that button. If you want to go to the mixer, you touch that button and you select the inputs. They're the four inputs. It's probably not the greatest anyway. I just, just don't have anything on the desktop that I can show you. Just but, so um, I know, is, is so we know, right? Is, is that uh, in your hand there? Is that controlling the switcher yep. actually at Groot Island? Right now, if I press one of those buttons, I'll change the program. You could be very popular. I know. That'd be almost, <laughs> almost as good as throwing a Zoom session off the air. Who'd yeah. do that? Well, the idea was uh, the, behind all this, because this is the basis of what I've done up in the Torres Strait. Very, the same system, but mm. I've just redone the, the web page for the seven inch touchscreen. Up there, they've got a seven inch touchscreen on its edge because they've got quite a few studios there. So it's in a portrait mode mm. and it's sitting on the console in the main studio. And they just go, oh, you want to listen to that one? They touch that, fade it up, done. That's all they're going to do. And they can cue, listen to it. This one on Groot, what they have is three studios and there's no controlling studio. And that was the problem. There was one guy who used to travel 70 kilometers to do a program in another community and then travel back home again. You do that every couple of days and it was just costing time and money and everything, you know, right. and frustrating. And, um, but there's no one controlling studio. So what I had to do was set up, there's a couple of rack boxes go with that with pies inside them and the control interface. So, he then can sit back at that studio, one studio, wherever he is, and he brings up on his computer using no machine, like a VNC, mm. but no machine is really good for this, a perfect application. Brings it up really nicely. I was going to do web sockets, but it was all getting bigger than Ben Hur. Just no machine, it's free, no, downloaded. Boom. No machine. Yeah, called no machine. It's a great little desktop um, application for, okay remotely into other computers. And what I've set up is a um, VPN. And instead of setting up my own VPN server, I thought, I'll go the zero tier way, which is free, totally free. Nice mm. interface, web interface, all that. And you can get 50 connections for free. So great. So set that up. It's all streaming on that VPN service. Right. And so he can sit in this studio here and he says, I want to put that studio at the other end, my program to air down there. So he just brings it up on a web page and he can remote through no machine and then he can remotely control his studio at the other end and switch whatever he likes at the other end from where whichever studio he's sitting on. He can be in any three studios. Excellent. And he can do all that switching. And you put them all together 
to one big network for one person in one studio. Or they just bomb out, or you can bomb them out and put them up to satellite, or they can just take over themselves at that studio and do their local program. So I had to build all that flexibility into it. And uh, when I left a couple of hours ago, it was working fine. <laughs> it was beautiful. <laughs> and the operator is awesome. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, it's going to continue working fine. There's another useful tip there, though. Uh, but you mentioned Zero Tier, which is really, really excellent software for creating a tunnel um, yeah. from one place to another for yeah. some specific purpose. Like your remote studio at home. You yeah. want to control your automation system back of the main studio? Bring up Zero Tier. Mm. And um, you can put your no machine on it or VNC or team view, whatever you want to do. Right. Remotely. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, so in fact, you, you start to look at uh, some combinations of some of the to technologies that we've talked about. So if you mm -hmm. have clean feed uh, for moving your audio from one place to another, and yep. then you have a zero tier tunnel for getting yep. control of a remote machine, and you yep. start to be able to do some pretty clever things. Pretty. Well, that's right. You could use that Raspberry Pi at home nice little desktop little thing and you can just use that to do your switching at your studio mm. get switch your audio in from clean feed or whatever mm. okay and you know it was a it was a again a solution that they wanted um they didn't have a lot of money of course um they didn't want to spend a lot of money but mm. um it solved a problem and it really did and it was reasonably cheap you know to do it and the okay. parts had to be available that was the thing too they said can we buy the parts in the shop and said, yep, go to JCAR, the bulk of that was in JCAR. And then Core Electronics, another company who supplied bits and pieces, audio cards, um, Element 14, and that was it. Mm. All the parts came from there. Certainly, uh, JCAR is now carrying large amounts of Raspberry Pi and indeed Arduino uh, uh, product. Uh, and that that seems to be the next wave for the hobbyist. This is where they're they're putting mm. the attention. But mm. you can do a lot with the with those bits. Yeah. Look, we're coming up to um, eight o'clock. It's been uh, a barrel of laughs. It's been good to have everybody's uh, contribution. Let's just sort of quickly go round the grounds and uh, see what exciting things you're working on, and um, you know any part parting thoughts. Um, I'll, I'll start with Al. Oh, and what I've been working on, uh, my most recent uh, major project been working on has been actually rebuilding a uh, an AM directional uh, antenna site down in uh, Melbourne that uh, 3KND broadcast from after a, uh, a fire in that we had a uh, an ACU burn down and that's taken us just under two years to rebuild. <laughs> That would be an antenna coupling unit? Antenna coupling unit, yes. yes. So for mm. a, a, a three, a two tower array with uh, three services on each. Mm. Mm. And and how much power going in there? Uh, five kilowatts per service, but we built it to be rated to 20 kilowatts per service. And so just for anybody who might be tuning in late and wondering if this is something you could do at home, how many volts? <laughs> Uh, what the base voltage depends on base. the frequency yes up to uh, uh, Swear everybody come on blow the pants off them those those ones are probably sitting the base voltage on the antennas are probably around 30 or forty thousand volts. okay so kids don't try this at home no no <laughs> good for lighting up fluorescent tubes as you stand at the base holding it in your hand yeah Definitely yeah, you have can't. A lot of fun. You can't turn off the lights in the uh, in the ACU. <laughs> mm. <laughs> um, uh, Evan, so your big project has been the uh, the Raspberry Pi work. Yeah, yeah, still working on that. Then projects on developing this one, um, which I have virtually got this now to plug into a, a 4G router. Right. So if you want an OB box, two of these, one of the studio, take it out to the OB, plug the 4G router into it. Plug your little mixer into it, and away you go. There's, so I'm just refining that one, so that's good. But while I was on Groot, I just got another job, mm. um, as you do. Um, they want to cover the island in FM services, and the, the island's 70, 80 kilometers wide, you know, so there's a lot of small outstations, and they're missing out on the broadcast. Right. And they like to get information out to everybody, whether it be cyclones or health or whatever. Mm. So... Um, the discussion started to build up and talk about that. How can we do this? 
network and, of infill stations. Yeah, yeah. Mm. yeah. And there's a good backbone um, of data, point-to-point -point ubiquity stuff sitting out there now. Mm. And it's all been just put up for this guy that I was working with. And so we've got a good, good link so we can stream everywhere we want to go and then find some sites where we can put FM transmitters on towers. So there's a little project I've got to think about now. <laughs> Yeah. And many trips back to Groot. Thank you. Steve, what's exciting you and what have you been working on? Um, a few things. Uh, yeah, planning for studio refits um, in the first to second quarter of next year. Um, do, do you believe everybody is, is going to be coming back to the studios? Is that sort of the expectation or is there still yeah. going to be a lot of working from home? Uh, no, a lot of, yeah, coming back. Yeah, that's sort of the plan. Hmm. Um, even if, the, yeah, w throughout the, all of lockdown, we still had on air people in the studio, um, at least one person. Uh, if we had two people, they were, we had two studios on air at the same time. Right. Just, you know, with breakfast duos and that sort of thing. Uh, wow. But, yeah. We, um, and, but then we also had co hosts that were at, at home. So, uh, the, but there was always still someone in the studio. Um, right through the main ships so yeah so it's planning that we're also looking at interconnecting all the three studio uh, stations that i'm involved in and overseeing um just to uh help with uh supporting each other with um on-air stuff and mm. uh, content sharing that sort of thing um brisbane station we're in the middle of installing a new transmitter there and uh yeah and then also project next year is that they're um, planning to move to a new building so acquiring their own facility so at the moment they're in rented space so hmm. it's going to be a major major project next year so, yeah. okay and and geordie what's uh, what's keeping you excited at cmto um well actually putting together our resources for our new accredited course. Um, so Certificate for and Screen and Media has recently been upgraded. So we are working towards, uh, with Technorama, on putting together a skill set on tech skills. So studio tech skills, broadcast tech skills. Mm -hmm. um, so watch this space because we'll hopefully have mm. a bit of a qualification coming through the pipeline next year and hopefully i'll have stephen al evan and john teaching some part of it writing some part of it and many more. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, into the new year which will be great we'll finally have an actual qualification um skill set that we'll be able to roll out to people um so you know plenty of people who are in the chat tonight might, might be something that you're in, you'd be interested in taking on so we're hopefully going to run it um across the country we're looking at about mid next year for our pilot program mm, that sounds excellent and that, so that's going to be yeah. yeah um there, there's a project that we've been working on at the moment we've actually started delivery on which is a formal mentoring program for technologists um so building mm. both the the program to deliver and also starting to build pools of mentors we'll be working on and that is going to lead to delivery of um, units then skill sets and then finally uh, we're aiming towards the the full qualification certificate for qualification which the CMTO will be able to deliver as a registered training organization and mm. if all of this comes to pass this is going to be well essentially a rekindling of what we had up until the late 80s when the broadcast operator certificate of proficiency went away a uh, very mm. sad thing for the industry so you're, you're sort of witnessing the rebirth, the rebirth of of training <laughs> for technologists which is um, really great and it's mm. been a long road so thank you yeah. very much to john and everyone else who's really pitched in to keep us thank you keep mm. the fires burning oh it's good to hear yeah now, that sort of information i can pass on to a couple of organizations who are looking for young people oh you know, please do yeah I, i've got a few lined up already and they're asking me how do we do a course what can we do you know yeah and mm. um yeah and i want to have a rest 
<laughs> but you yes. have to teach them all first, Evan. I oh, know, I know. <laughs> Sooner or later, all the old yeah, farts want to when retire. Are you going to retire? Yeah. yeah. Right, yeah. I'm still giving me jobs. <clears throat> I, I will just leave you with um, the, the thing that I've been working on, and I, I did a write up for um, Radio Info. So um, if you go to the Radio Info site and you search on the word frayed, F R A Y E D, uh, which is the name of an ABC TV program, and at the beginning of the year, Year, I had the opportunity to build a 1980s radio station for the filming. So the scene appears in episode two, I think about three minutes in. I, I used to know the exact time code, but um, you can you can watch it. It's on ABC iView at the moment. And the, the brief was, it was just a very short piece, two minute sort of uh, uh, comedy thing that happened within the show where they needed to do an interview in a 1980s radio station and and really you, you cannot take a current radio station and pretend that it's 1980s because well they didn't have screens they didn't have computers they didn't have lots of things and so the challenge was what does a 1980s radio studio look like um, ultimately it ended up looking like uh, hang on where's the rodent gone okay there uh, it looked a bit like this so this is the control room as it appeared uh, an old 1970s awa uh, mixer the um, <laughs> that's actually a live eight uh, phone line telephone, telephone switch talkback up. switching switching unit, which was actually working. So the lights were, were actually doing yep. flashy things. Um, we had uh, three microphones in the studio, plus the producer wanted another microphone on a gooseneck, so we provided that, little panels. So it, it looked fairly... Um, fairly realistic um, son effects cart machines and some cue master cart machines that i had to get going so there was a period in january where much smoke was coming out of this house where i plugged things in there were bangs and then things got fixed if you have a very careful look in the background here you can see uh, the venerable um Roller. Uh, it was a roller 77 mark 3 tape recorder from the day uh, there's a control room. So this is a shot of me sitting in the control Gee. room. Uh, so the audio desk there was actually what was running the microphone. So the microphone's running through that back to the metering in the AWA console uh, because I wanted the scene to be anorak proof. So as they talked, the meters were actually moving. There was a couple more uh, cart machines here, the 751s. And uh, you can see in the background there yet another... Um, Practel monitor bridge, another Rod McCubbin hybrid unit. So all realistic uh, because it was real and actually all working in a practical sense uh, stuff. This is what it looked like off air. And uh, interestingly, the quality off air when it was broadcast was sufficiently good that these pictures, which I snapped with a mobile phone from a TV screen, were better quality and crisper than the equivalent pictures off iView. And uh, oop, not mm. that one there. That's looking back the other way. So there you go. You can watch mm. it and, and have some fun. Um, when we finish this broadcast, you will all have these forms that say, oh, I've just done a, uh, a, a webinar on the CMTO platform. Please fill this in. Tell us what you thought. Tell us what you'd like us to do in the coming year. We would love to have your thoughts. We'd love to know um, whether you enjoyed this or whether you just hung around because you couldn't be b bothered turning off the computer. Um, either way, it's fine. We'd like to know. Um, I would like to thank the panel for joining us. Um, for uh, for staying in so long and, and we can all go and have dinner now. Stephen, Al, Evan, thank you very much. Yep. Geordie, for staying back way longer than she said she was going to. Just too damn interesting. Couldn't well, wait. Well, there you go. Yes. <laughs> and and Geordie is actually the closet technologist. She doesn't tell people this very much, but uh, <laughs> she, she can rub two wires together very effectively. There you go. That's, That's the person that we want at the helm of the CMTO. Uh, can I thank everybody for being here, for, for you, for joining us from wherever it is that you're, you're tuned in. Uh, tell your friends, this will be available for viewing back uh, off the recording.
And uh, don't forget to join us at the Technorama AGM if you're a member. If you're not a member, you still have time to go to the Technorama website, sign up. It only costs 10 bucks. Come on, it's cheap. Join Technorama. Help us to do all the things we need to do for you by being part of the movement. So there you go. On behalf of the panel, thank you very much. John Maisel saying good night. We will catch you for another webinar in the new year. Thanks very much. Good night, good. everybody. Good.